you have a Legend polynomial here that takes into account the spin and brings, brings in the T dependence. There is no crossing symmetry in any experimental analysis ever. No, the polynomial is just to describe some smooth background that you don't really understand that you try to match with it. So of course, I mean, this is not analytic. You, you don't have any control of unitarity because you have explicit phases which completely screw all the imaginary parts. So there is nothing there. But it still kind of works, at least in the simplest situation, when you have uh, narrow resonances. Uh, when things become, uh, start overlapping and look more messy, uh, people are still use this kind of answers. But the question is, can we do something better? Can we use, at least, in an elastic way, some of these constraints to, you know, to make them constrained, so to, to have a better understanding of the result that we can get from this sample without just, you know, um, having total freedom on what we can get. And I will show an actual example where these kind of things can be important. Uh, so let me summarize what are the... Uh, well, can't you, What are the S matrix constraints and what's the, are the importance of that in this context? Well, you all know analyticity. Unitarity. And crossing. So as for uh, searching for resonances, you want to have analytic concepts because you know you cannot violate causality. You want to keep unitarity as much as possible, even though you are in the situation that you don't really can have controls of all the channels. And the reason is that you can use unitarity to access the unphysical Riemann sheet and to understand the, the, the analytic structure in all the different sheets. So when I talk about unitarity, I'm thinking about uh, not only elastic unitarity, but at least couple channel unitarity, but not just as a, uh, as, a, as a bound, but really imposing unitarity in all the channels as a constraint. The least important for this is crossing symmetry. And the reason for that is that you have sectors where this is important. For example, in pi pi scattering, you are, the pi mass is so close to zero that, I mean, the importance of the left hand cut is relevant. Crossing symmetry is important to describe the asymptotic of the amplitudes at high energy because you enter the, uh, the regge limit, so the exchanges in the cross channel is, is relevant. But we are in, you are in the intermediate region, you can kind of loosen this constraint. So in general, we are trying to describe amplitudes which satisfy constraint in that way. Um, so let me start with the theory constraint that I'm going to use, and then I'll show you the data. And for doing that, I'll introduce the original method where uh, Bootstrap was derived. So let's consider a simple example of 2 to 2 scattering. So we have two particles Elastic scattering for now. And let me consider two non-identical particles, but with equal masses, just to simplify a bit the notation. So we can isolate the density part. We have a delta function that enforces momentum conservation. And then we have our scattering amplitude here. And we are going to project into partial weights. The usual way.
Okay, when I write elastic unitarity in partial waves, the integral relation be be becomes algebraic, so everything looks simple. Where rho is the two body phase space. So it's the Chelem function. Okay, so we know the analytic structure of this partial wave. We know there's some right hand cut, there's some left hand cut, starting from threshold, so, and some left hand cut starting from zero. So the ansatz introduced by, I think it was Chu and Mandelstam, it was basically to separate these two cuts in a multiplicative way. So to write the amplitude, as a numerator function which only contains the left hand cut and a denominator function that only contains your right hand cut. Um, you can still impose that those two functions are real analytic because you know that below threshold this function is real, so you can define the phase between the two in order for them to be real right below threshold. So they're both the analytic, and since you know uh, that, I mean, this guy has only right hand cut, and this guy has only left hand cut by construction, uh, you can define this special relation for it. So you can. Sorry. Yes. Well, the logic is that unitarity, if you write that for the inverse of the amplitude, it's just that the imaginary part of the inverse of the amplitude is minus the phase space. So that looks simpler. And indeed, you put the right hand cut where unitarity applies here in the denominator. And the numerator is basically all the rest. But you're not saying anything about whether this function can have zero. And therefore, this I, I'll tell that in a second, yeah. Um, So I, I still have some freedom to choose the normalization. So for example, I'll define D of L to, to be finite for S going to infinity. And I define the normalization between the two in such a way that D of L is in zero is one. Okay, so with this, I can define my dispersion relation. So here I should have the imaginary part of D of L, and I can use my unitary equation here. Let me put a, a small r here to mean that I'm calculating the imaginary part on the right hand cut. Where does the left cut start? Huh? The left cut start. Well, since I said it's equal masses, it starts at zero. Um, so I can rewrite the equation in this form. minus the phase space. Now this T inverse is nothing but D over N. But since as I said, N has no right hand cut, contains only left hand cut, I can, it's real on the right hand cut, so I can take it out from the imaginary part. And this becomes the unitary equation. So I can plug this information into the dispersion relation. And to enforce the fact that uh, it must be one in S equals zero, I can subtract.
Okay. And a similar equation holds for uh, the numerator function. And now I'm dispersing over the left hand cut. Now I calculate the imaginary part over the left hand cut of my full amplitude. And this just reads as a simple dispersion relation. Okay. So that was the original game for Bootstrap. And the idea is that you plug a model for the discontinuity of the amplitude on the left hand cut using, for example, some Mason exchange model in the cross channel. Then you use this information as, a, um, as an input for the amplitude, and then you solve the system of couple integral equation. It doesn't work for a simple reason that as you say, you don't know, you didn't impose anything about the zeros of these guys. And there's actually the, the CDD ambiguity arise from here, so you can still have the freedom of adding any possible poles in the denominator function that corresponds to zeros of the amplitude. That look like this. Okay, so actually this equation is an infinite class of solutions. It's, it's not possible to, to find a single solution. So at the beginning, people uh, had reasons based on regex phenomenology to say that this guy couldn't be there, uh, but it didn't really work. I mean, if you try to use this program to understand the low energy spectrum, it just fails, so you really need uh, you need these guys to describe the, the low energy resonances. And the reason is that uh, QCD is behind that. So somehow QCD is providing some, uh, some under, underlying seed to, um, to, to, to give you these guys there. Can you talk a little sure. bit on the left cut? You said some words about, I thought, I thought the left cut was harder to, than the right cut. Uh, that's right, but it's also farther from the physical, for the physical region. So you say, okay, if I put some modeling in there, uh, it cannot be that bad. So that was the original thing. So the point is you, uh, you put, for example, some meson exchange in the T-channel with some simple model. Uh, then you project these over partial waves in the S-channel, and you use this function as an input for this. And then you can try to, to improve this a little bit. But that was basically the idea. So having models for the original. Uh, like the left cap, I take from the middle. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm basically ignoring crossing, yeah. I, I'm having some information about crossing because I have resonances in the, in the T channel, uh, but I don't have a full crossing symmetric amplitude. And you basically never have when you deal with partial waves in the sense that, I mean, the crossing equation between becomes uh, a set of infinite equations that involves all the partial waves. So at a practical level, if you want to work for, with partial waves, uh, you just can't do much of it. This is inequality, yeah. So uh, here I'm talking about elastic unitarity. And I will keep it that way. I'll include couple channels, so um, so I will still use this inequality, uh, but with multiple channels. The good thing of all this formalism is that it's easily generalizable to couple channel just by making these object matrices. Okay, so this will become uh, these guys will all become matrices in the in the in the channel space, and the same thing holds. No. No. Absolutely, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, but I have a reason for that, because I, otherwise I basically cannot 
do anything with unitarity. But unitarity is still telling me how, how I can sum up things, okay? If I imagine that I have different resonances in the same channel, uh, I cannot just, you know, blindly sum them up. I, I need to satisfy some principle. And the only practical way to do that is imposing some form of unitarity. Um, uh, let me keep like this way because I, I, I show you how to kind of tweak this, but still put in some constraint. Um, okay, last thing I want to introduce is four factor that we discussed Monday. And, and the reason for that is that, as I said, there is basically no meso scattering in real life. So I have to deal with some production mechanism. Um, so to do that, I can erase here. So let me consider now the insertion of a scalar current. Right. Uh, well, the problem is that you cannot store it. So you can have a beam just by, you know, you smash protons onto a target, and you collect the pions. But yes, yeah, so you cannot create two because you cannot, you cannot save the pion to, you know, to make it. And then the actual luminosity that you can reach uh, in a fixed target experiment is much higher than colliding two beams. Because when you collide two beams, you know, you have two very tiny objects. If you put two targets and two beams. The luminosity is too low. So it's, it's impossible at a practical level. I mean, people are thinking about muon scattering. But muons are uh, a factor of uh, 50 longer lived than pion, so it's it's at least it's thinkable and it's challenging. I mean, there is no they're just you know starting now thinking about. It. So, so for four factor definition are similar, so. The delta function and I can project into partial waves as I did there, so I won't write that. I just write how unitarity equation looks like at the partial wave level. Yes, I'm thinking about Fourier transforming this, so I'm inserting some, some momentum, P, Pj, if you like, and then I still have the, the, the conservation of the volume. So, so this is also a function of the square? Yes, it's still a function of S and T, if you like. Where, where, three uh, no, because this brings a, a momentum in, if I Fourier transform. And so I have one particle here and two particles here. So it's a two to two process effectively. Yeah, but now I, I have the mass of this guy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the unitarity relation for the, um, for the four factor. And that leads to the so called Watson theorem that we discussed before. It basically tells you that since the imaginary part must be a real number, F and T must have the same phase in order for this to be real, okay? So what does it mean at a practical level? Well, let's look at this form here. So we say that on the right hand cut, this guy is the only one who can have uh, imaginary parts. So this denominator function is the only one that uh, brings a phase in. 
where that's the, the numerator function is real. So the easiest way of solving this Yes. So T is the scattering amplitude of one two, the elastic one two to one two. So it's the same as here. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry for my handwriting. Yeah, this is F, and this is F. No? This is also an F. Yeah, you have uh, an equivalence class of several letters. So as I said, since I want this object to have the same face as this, the easiest way is just to choose the same denominator function, but a different numerator function here that I'll just call small n. Okay, that is unconstrained by unitarity because unitarity here is a, li a linear constraint, so it's much weaker than a quadratic constraint as for scattering. Okay. So now let's talk about the data. The data I'm interested in come from Compass. It's basically a pi on beam colliding into a proton target. And I want to study this pi on eta proton final state. So let me call as the invariant mass of the eta pi system, T, the, the momentum exchange between the pi on and T1, the, um, the momentum exchange between the target and the recoil proton. So in the regime we are interested in, we have that S is of the order of, let's say, 1.5 GB square, which is where I say that there is the interest in physics coming in. Let me call S total here. S total is of the order of 20 GB square. So you see that there is no way I can think of taking into account all the possible channels here. Also T1, which is the, the, um, the momentum transfer in the proton, is small. Okay. So if I just look at this, uh, I would say, okay, there is, uh, there is nothing I can do with this. And then you have to start putting some phenomenology to, to apply this kind of formalism to this data. The first thing that you can do is that, okay, if I just look at the proton side, so if I ignore for a moment what's happening here, I see that there is some process at very high energy and I'm looking at the, a very small t. So I'm in the regel limit. And in the regel limit, I can describe this amplitude as function that go like this. It's basically the energy at the power of alpha t, where alpha is the regge trajectory. And in standard regge theory, just a linear function. And since t is very small and basically dominated by the s to the power alpha zero. And uh, if I look at the, uh, at the usual regge trajectories, 
in the, in the two Frauci plots okay. here. For the Mason trajectory, they look like this, where the intercept here is smaller than one. So here you have the raw Mason, for example, to, so the whole tower of edge trajectories. But since you have the raw Mason here, the, 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 the intercept is smaller than one. So if you calculate the cross-section, here you have a, a number which is smaller than one, you get a cross-section that's going to zero asymptotically. So it doesn't, well, it doesn't agree with data. So the cross-section is slightly rising, almost slightly more than constant. Um, so it was introduced a brand new regge trajectory, which is called the Pomeron. That was basically introduced to explain the, the asymptotic of proton-proton uh, uh, scattering at high energies. And it's characterized by having an intercept close to one. If you fit two data, you get some, something like 1.08. So it basically, it's an ad hoc trajectory that you introduce to satisfy, basically to saturate the frost bound. Right, but uh, for example, you could exchange uh, F2 mesons, which are on these trajectories, but that still wouldn't explain, it would go down. Yeah, Pomeron has vacuum quantum numbers, and it's, it's, it was also introduced to satisfy the pomeran theorem, so the fact that PP and PP bar have the same cross-section at asymptotic energies. Is it correct to think of it as a global trajectory, or? Uh, Morally, yes. Uh, in practice, God knows where really glue bolts are in the physical spectrum of QCD. And, uh, and uh, I would say no for another reason. That's what I'm going to tell you here. Um, so if you consider of glue bolts, basically the first pole here would be the glue ball of spin two. Okay, so you would expect this spin two to be somehow relevant for, for this. But now you, you want to play this game. So first you, you want to separate the amplitude with this Pomeron piece, now that you know. OK. Actually, I mean, the factorization of regge residues is kind of proved a little is, uh, for high energy, so it kind of uh, justifies a picture like that. And we are going to talk about this top part in a second. Um, so the question about the, 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 the glue ball and the presence of the spring two is that now if you look at this object, uh, you can study, for example, the angular dependence to measure somehow the the, the spin brought by these guys. And in particular, there is some azimuthal angle which is related to that. And, and what you see is that basically it's compatible with the, with the Pomeron having spin one. So you are sensitive to the fact that uh, the, uh, the intercept of the trajectory is actually one. Although you would expect that the first pole happens for the, for the tensor glue bone. So, the punchline is that really you cannot think of these objects are uh, particle with definite spin. Okay, it's really a continuous spin thing. Well, I guess I meant the whole trajectory. The whole trajectory. The whole thing. Yeah. In principle, in principle, yes, but there is no. I mean, at, at this level, it just doesn't matter. So, because of the thing I just said, so the fact that you are dominated by this thing having spin one, now I can think of an effective two to two object here. So some incoming proton, uh, some incoming pomeron that scatters with the pion in a pieta final state. So of course, now I don't know much about, about this Pomeron here. I'm approximating this with a particle of spin one F 
having as much uh, as much the uh, the virtuality t1 that I can measure in data, and I can see if that works uh, with real stuff. So let me just show you some data. So there is uh, this problem, for example, in one of the of the partial way that you wanna study. So if you uh, if you study the system, for example, with one unit of angular momentum in L equal one, you look at different channels. You see the eta pi and eta prime pi. Eta prime is just the singlet of the SU3. You would expect to see basically the same physics happening here, but you see that you basically are measuring two different peaks, which are fairly displaced. Okay. Um, so experimentalists measure the, the, the parameters for the end. They claim, okay, there are two different states with these quantum numbers, and this is not compatible with your expectation, either from quark model or also with lattice calculation. You expect to have just one. Okay, so it looks like if you do simple uh, models, as the Brevigner one I was uh, telling you before, you cannot understand what's going on here. Yes. You say that uh, the peak of the distribution, it's like it's placed. That's what you mean when you say. In the two channel, you see that in the in the top plot, it peaks around 1.3, and in the bottom plot, it peaks around 1.6. You you get different. Yeah. Okay. So now what you want to do is to use this kind of formulas still in a phenomenological way. So you just parameterize whatever you don't know with something that sounds reasonable. So in particular here, instead of building some models for the left-hand cut, you just plug some, uh, some function having some far away resonances. So something like, um, having some higher order pole in the, uh, in the negative in the negative, uh, for negative S. So now you can use this definition for the denominator based on this seed for the N function. And you still have to put something for this small n here that would be related to the exchange in the production amplitude. So in this, if you like, Pomeron eta scattering that you don't know, you know nothing. So, but still it's important that it's smooth in the physical region. So you just put an expansion in polynomials. And what you get from the fit works pretty well. So here I'm showing at the left, it was the same plot as before. The central column is the reference data that, that corresponds to the L equal to uh, angular momentum here. And you do this because you want to use the information about phase. But of course, you can only measure relative phase. So you need to measure this with respect to some other thing. And the relative phase are the plots at right. Top column is the data in the, um, in the eta pi final state. And the bottom plot is the eta prime pi. So the fit works. This model has some freedom, but you know, it still gives a good description. Sorry. Yes. Can you all never zero? Yes. And I, I can write, well, it'll take too, too long to write the explicit expression. But uh, basically, you cannot do anything with this formula if you don't introduce CDD poles At, out of the, the light scalar sector when you can actually have some reasonable description, but for the higher resonance, it's basically impossible. The reason is that you need QCD to put some, some resonances in there, and just the constraint of the S matrix don't know anything about that. But I was worried about extrapolating T0, but maybe you're just not worried about it. Extrapolating where? In T0, yeah. NL over ER. Yes. So you make some answers for NL? Yes, so NL is smooth, so it doesn't contain any, any pole. Well, it, it cannot because of analyticity. So um, when, when, I mean, D of L can have, can have uh, uh, zeros, but not on the, on the first sheet, okay? So 
the actual zeros actually happen in the in the official sheet. But now you have analytic answers, so you can actually go to the official sheet and check, and cannot have false because well, not the first sheet, yeah, and, and it doesn't have a right hand cut, so it cannot help you produce the false. Uh, in in experimentalist words. D is your signal. It contains the physics you are interested in because it's the physics of resonances. N is and small n and big n are just your background that describe whatever smoothness in there. Oh, sorry, I, yep. I think I missed the question. So, do you actually have two poles that play with two peaks? Uh, that's think. next slide. Ah, sorry. <laughs> That just, I'm playing with the models, okay? So I, I just want to have the simplest model allows me to fit data. And now I can check the poles. So if I look at the D wave, which was the big one, where the situation is more clear, I know from lattice, from quark models, to expect two resonances, and I find two resonances. It's the, the red dots, okay? And if I go to the, to the P wave, I find only one. And you see that if you follow the strength of the amplitude, when you reach the real axis, the direction of the strength is kind of bending to the left in the case of eta pi and bending to the right in the case of eta prime pi. And that explains why the two peaks appear displaced on the real axis in, in actual data. But they correspond to the pole in the very same location, and just to one single pole. So that points to the existence of just one single resonance. You don't really put the, I mean, you don't put the complex poles by hand, okay? They just come out for the feet. You put, this is a real expression, okay? So there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between what you put here and what you get. And in, you put some value of SI. You put some, yeah, and you feed those, okay? So you, and you can try with different numbers of this. So basically, whenever you, you add one of these poles on the real axis, it kind of helps you having a, a pole in the, in the complex plane. But as I said, there is no one-to-one. -one. And in general, you produce way more poles in the complex plane than you should. Okay? So you only care about the poles which are on the physical region and correspond you know, to, the, to the structure you see in data. So how many parameters did you then do you have in total? Oh, in total, a lot. It's like 37. But chi squared is one point. I mean, you have like a lot of data points to fit. So, yeah. Where did you come to 30 SR there? Yes, that's another parameter that controls basically the size of it enters the imaginary part throughout the dispersive integral. So, it's the kind of things that I was telling you that I'm a bit flexible with unitarity because actually I have some freedom in determining the. The imaginary part here, which is driven by, by this guy. Right. And all the rest is just the gammas, gamma It's the gammas and some, as I said, this is an expansion in, uh, in polynomials, so there are some small parameters there. Thank you. But, but so the punchline is that with the position of the pole in the same plane, by changing the residue, uh -huh. you can shift the, the way that the peak appears on the real axis. Yes, I mean, the punchline is that I can produce these two peaks, so this place, with just one singularity, okay? So they actually, there is just one resonance that can explain the two. They have different residues, right? Sure, they have different residues, and there, there is different smooth function on top of that that help you displacing the thing. But here, the only thing that you care about is the pole position. Because for the residues to be trustable, you really have to take into account all the channels because you're losing some part. You can still claim that the pole position is the same even if you forget some of the, some of the channels, but you cannot really trust the residues. On top of that, that would be the residues of, well, the one you care about is the one of the scattering amplitude. But but you, you're not measuring the scattering lamp, you're measuring a production process. So this information is even more hidden in there. It could, although if you, if you, it's, it's not that easy. I mean, the, the effect of the, 
of the production here is not just an overall factor then that you take out. So uh, then <laughs> one can use another bootstrap thing. But bootstrap is a kind of overused word. And, uh, so this comes from statistics. Bootstrap means that basically uh, you take your original data, you want to understand what's the um, how to propagate in a correct way the statistical error. So what you do is basically you take the original data point and you shake that. So you generate new sets of pseudodata according to the original one, and you refit and refit. So basically at the end of the day, you, you have a big samples of different curves and fit values. And then you can use this information, for example, to uh, point by point calculate the average and the deviation that gives you the error band on the, on the, on the fit curve. But more important, you can see how the pole position moves in the, in the complex plane. And you can use this information to see if, I mean, if, if what you are claiming is trustable or not. So first of all, you look at the D wave. And you see that, I mean, there are always poles more or less in the same position. They move a bit because of the statistical uncertainty. And you see that, I mean, there was this huge peak that was very narrow and that basically it cannot move that much. So the position is very well determined. It's the red one there. The other one is much smaller, so it's not as well determined, but still. And that's the blue one. And then you have garbage, because as I said, uh, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the CDD factor that you put in and the poles in the complex plane. And then you have these left-hand singularities that appear in the dispersive integral. So that means they are hidden in the physical sheet. So you will find them eventually. But you can use these things, for example, to see where those other singularities are located, what's their behavior when you, you start you know, uh, shaking data, and, and, and see if they could correspond to something that looks like a physical state or not. And that thing I left definitely doesn't look like anything physical, also because it's very close to, to fresh. Oh, here I'm using the mass and width instead of really imaginary parts. So uh, it just mass is the, the real part of the square root of the pole position and the width is minus twice the imaginary part. It's just to match with the standard by beginner definitions. And now the more interesting one, which is the, uh, the, the the P wave, what I was talking about. You see that you have lots of structures. Uh, you have lots of structures on the left. So also cluster of poles that can come from far away, but they are fairly broad. And uh, if you start shaking other parameters of the model, you see that all these clusters move like crazy. So that means they don't really correspond to physics. It's just an artifact of the model that you are, you are, you are playing with. But the red cluster is always in the same position, OK? So that makes you think that, OK, that pole should really stay there. But nothing of the rest is really physical. Sorry. Yep. So the red one is the one I just say I trust. Sorry. Yep. And um, <laughs> well, that's just because. That's the technique, OK? So you generate lots of samples, OK? And for each of that, you look for poles, and you put a dot in this plot. So you just see how these things are, OK? And yeah, sometimes, I mean, things move a bit. But you can still define a cluster, so yeah, you can calculate the center and the deviation. And so this is the final result. For this, I don't know if you can see the gray lines. So gray lines are just different models that you can play with. For example, you can use different functional forms of this. So you change whatever is not really constrained by, by your theory. So in some sense, you're still model dependent, but you try as many models as you can. And you always find basically very similar conclusions. So you always sign a single cluster in the in the, uh, in the P wave, you find that positions are compatible, and you can use the deviation between these different models are yours, estimate for systematic uncertainties. And uh, I think I can just 
stop here. So the punchline is that um, you don't know much about uh, strong interactions in this regime, uh, but still you know something. Uh, you know that these constraints are not rigorous in this, in this regime, uh, but still you can use this to do a bit better with what people usually do to put some more robustness into the extraction of this um, excited spectrum of QCD. I think that's enough. <laughs> Uh, did I understand you correctly that uh, there is only one hybrid meson, uh, or exotic, whatever, only yeah. one exotic meson instead of two that appear in some Different PDG, displays. whatever? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I see, okay. But it's still not ex not easily explained by some, mes uh, by some two quark model? Or uh, well, in a two quark model, it's impossible to have those quantum numbers, so well, yeah, I, I didn't talk about that, but I mean, the quantum number that happens in the P wave is. Um, That's the reason for the name exotic, right? Because it's not simply explained by yeah. two quarks rotating yeah. on a. So those JPC correspond to one minus plus, which is impossible to have in the quark model. And that's why, I mean, that was interesting because there were QCD inspired models. Uh, some of that expired by the flux tube, for example, that predicted um, these mesons to exist. Actually, predicted a whole multiplet of these hybrid mesons. But a smoking gun is this one because its quantum numbers are not allowed in the quark model. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's so, so, so Sergey and I, we tried to, with the help of our pseudoscalar, uh, to explain this. But one of the problems was that there were too many. Uh, of this exotic methods, so, <laughs> so then it didn't work, but maybe there's only one. Uh, we should try again. Yeah. Okay, thanks. More question? Um, is Lattice uh, able to get this uh, uh, exotic mass and so or uh, are there lattice uh, that available for that? Maybe. People are working yeah. on it. Yeah. I mean, doing, I mean, so there are calculations of excited spectrum where you ignore the width. And, no. okay. So the, there are a lot of spectrum of, um, of excited states where the width to, to, to decay to, to scattering states is ignored. Um, doing more sophisticated calculations where you don't ignore the width, which is important in a state like this, that takes more work, but but there are yeah. groups that are trying to do this, and I'll talk about yeah. efforts in this direction. So. Yeah, but not at physical biomasses for now. No, no, yeah, we can forget so about that. So the point is now. that at least, you know, you can have on lattice like pion masses like high enough that you can limit the number of multiparticle open channels that would just kill the, the possibility to do that. And yeah, I mean, with the experimental data, it's a bit more complicated to change the pion mass. So. But do you mean that you can go even to the case where this resonance becomes stable by lifting the pion mass enough? In principle, yeah. Yeah. Nobody's done, no, no, nobody has even done that. Yeah. For now, the only thing that you, you have is the information about the, the, the one particle spectrum, okay? So you completely neglect any information about scattering, and you see that you have energy levels, you say, okay, if I see something here, it's likely I will have a, some actual resonance. And, and yeah. As far as I know, there are calculations ongoing for this, at least you know, for heavy pion masses where you have only two body, uh, two body decay is open. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank again on this. I don't trust the lessons.
the ratio of the messages is linear. Close there are too many channels here, but you can. Yeah, yeah, but the fact that you can describe them 